I will not miss your word. I will not miss that word that you have sent to heal me, to deliver me. I will not miss my word tonight. I will not miss my visitation. I will not miss my word. I will not miss my visitation. Lord, I thank you. For you have found me worthy that you will send your word tonight to heal me, to deliver me, to save me. Father, Lord, I will not miss my visitation. As you send your word tonight, I receive it with meekness in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, thank you. Father, we give you praise. We exalt you, glorify you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I want you to welcome Pastor Moses, the prophet of our time. Great man of God. All right, praise God. God is good. Hallelujah. God is good. Let's be seated. Amen, amen, amen. All righty. Well, thank you, Big Miss, for getting ready to catch her. Oh, yeah, I saw that. That was, that, that was, that was close. Yeah, God is good. God is good. All righty. I know that you all are very settled where you're at, but then if you want to come to the middle, you're welcome to do so. Um, someone needs to come and take Alan and Diamond's seat here if they can. Yeah, God is good. Oh, my sister Kenyatta, good to see you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Praise God for victories. All righty. God is good. Anybody else gone back to listen to Tuesday's message? Anybody? Oh, yeah. All righty. God is good. Awesome things happened. Um, I mean, there were prophetic words on Tuesday. You know, there were some folks who came up to be prayed for, and, and Justin is one of them, and he has an amazing testimony. But then I decided to be merciful and said, when he's ready, we want to hear it. Maybe one of these Tuesdays. But such an awesome uh, testimony of God's goodness. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more perhaps later today because it is what the Lord is doing in the times that we're in that many more of us will get to experience. And so the fact that he and some other people may have experienced it doesn't mean the curtains have been drawn or closed. It just means that God is letting us know that these things are beginning to happen. And so I have said to us, um, okay, let me, let me start by saying thank you for everybody that wished me a happy birthday on Thursday, I believe it was. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you all very greatly. Um, I've, I've had an amazing time being celebrated this year, um, beginning with the party that we had on Tuesday. That was, that was glorious. If you missed it, you missed a good party. If you want to feel bad, it's okay. It a, was a really good party. And um, yeah, so you know, sometimes people enjoy celebrating their birthday. This time around, I can say that I enjoy being celebrated. Thank you all for all of the gifts and all of the greetings and the prayers. Um, in fact, someone that I would not mention um, who is not here is one of our friends and family from overseas left me a message and she was prophesying. And I told my wife, I said, wow, this must be a great year already. If this lady would prophesy, you know, because she's very academic, very calculated. Everything has got to be based on what she has been able to observe. And, you know, based on her estimation, what she thinks is, plot, is, is feasible. But then here she was prophesying. And I took that for yet another instance of the many signs that the Lord is pouring out His Spirit. Because th there are encounters that others have testified about and even from beyond these shores, we are beginning to see that the outpouring is real, is genuine, and it is something that each and every one of us should endeavor to tap into. Let me clarify, because I don't want anyone present here to not be fully, to not be able to fully enjoy and benefit from what the Lord is doing. We all have to be able to tap into it. You see, because Jesus said to Nicodemus, he said, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then afterwards, he said to the same Nicodemus that unless a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. 
So you can only enter that which you can see. If there is a door here, as there is a door here, if you cannot see that door, you're not likely to be able to enter through that door. And this is the bad example because the door that leads to the kingdom is nowhere near as big as that. <laughs> because the Bible says that narrow is the, the way. Narrow is the path and difficult is the way. And so if it's narrow in the midst of a wide, wide world, then it takes discernment and being able to see it to enter it. And let us forget about all of what is logical and all of what makes sense. The fact that Jesus said it should be enough for us to know that it is important for us to be able to see that which the Lord is doing. Because if we cannot see it, it is difficult for us, almost impossible for us to be able to press into it. So I want to encourage you to recognize what the Lord is doing and what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. One of the things that has become very critical in the times that we're in, and first of all, let me tell you that I recognize that there is a man or someone in here today that is yet to fully understand the reason why they have found themselves again and again falling on their faces. You keep finding yourself falling into crisis. You've been in trouble more times than you thought you signed up for. And you keep asking yourself, why? Why me? Why Lord? Why the dirt? When am I going to get out of mess? When am I going to get out of the Mary Clay? As I was in the spirit, seeking the face of God concerning my brethren who have chosen to regard the work that the Lord has asked us to do. Because again, I do not pray for the world. Jesus said in John 17, he says, I do not pray for the world, but I pray for these ones. And he made it very clear. He said to the Father, I do not pray that you take them out of the world. He said, but I want you to show your preeminence by preserving them in the world. And so a lot of people today are praying random prayers, praying out of the flesh, praying under the guidance of the false prophet, praying as it is being suggested by the seductress that is called the whore of Babylon. Many people are following the dictates of the goddess Medea, Media, who is known from ancient times to be the enchantress. And when you see believers, or not believers, Christians, because I like to make a distinction between believers and Christians. A Christian is somebody who identifies with that religion that was handed to us by the sun worshipers. But a believer is the one that recognizes that it is imperative to hear constantly the word of God. Because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Religion stipulates that you identify a set of rules, standards, frameworks, and liturgical practices, guardrails, that allow for you to obtain the approval of the ones that introduced it to you. Whereas faith, on the other hand, constitute a set of tools that are given to you and that you are discipled in that allows for you to become like the ones who disciple you. So that they are not always regarded as lords over you, but they are seen as helpers of your joy and co-laborers in the work of the kingdom. Anything outside of that, anything that brings the hierarchy of the Gentiles is not faith, it is religion. And so a lot of religious people, a lot of people who are, who are professing to be Christians, or as a friend of mine likes to say these days, a lot of people that identify as Christians. Because now that we have men identifying as women, it is helping us to understand the reason why some people have been where they've been. So they, they, they are not Christians, they just identify as Christians. 
And for so long, we didn't know. We were so confused. Because if you say that you're a Christian, in fact, some people dare to use the word believer. They say, oh, I'm a believer. I'm born again. But when we look at you, we do not see fruits that are worthy of repentance. And if we are to be that generation that will receive the Lord Jesus and the blue skies, then we have to operate at least at the level of John the Baptist. Because Jesus says of children or of men born of women, none has come greater than John the Baptist. But I tell you that even the least in the kingdom will be greater than he. So if the least in the kingdom that Jesus is building upon the earth, the kingdom of believers in the sonship of Jesus, if the least in that kingdom is meant to be greater than John the Baptist, then should we not at the minimum, just because we're humble, operate like John the Baptist? Because when John the Baptist was preaching in the wilderness, when he was speaking and baptizing people at the Jordan, the Pharisees came to him, the people of the religious order, who identified as the children of Abraham. You know, for centuries, they deceived the people. They called themselves children of Abraham and they got away with it for 400 years. From the time of Malachi, they got away with it simply because the Bible says for 400 years, the heavens were shut and there was no word from God. And in the 400 years wherein there was no word from God, the Pharisees built the monument of religion and used it to exploit the majority. That is why Jesus, when he came, he says, this thing that they have handed to you is the broad way that is easy and it leads to destruction. And that is why you find many walking in it. He says, but the way that leads to life is narrow. The path is narrow and the way is difficult and only a few are found in it. So when people tell you, whatever you and your pastor were saying at Communion House can't possibly be the truth because you guys are just a minority. Are you trying to say that the rest of, 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 of Christian dumb and the rest of the world and the rest of the news and the rest of the country is wrong? The answer is yes, they are, if they are not in alignment with the word of God. Simply because I put it to you that from time immemorial, we are failures at life when we are not good students of the past. But when we are good students of history, then we stand a chance at succeeding in the present because history teaches us that God is never found in the consensus of opinion. Wherever you find the voice of the majority, you do not find the word of God. It is the Romans that told us in Latin, Vohi populi, vohi dehi. They tell us that the voice of the people is the voice of God. Can you find that in the Bible? The voice of the people is not the voice of God. The voice of God is very clear. It is very distinct. The Bible says it is like thunder upon many waters. And it brings refreshing to the soul. The voice of God cannot be mistaken for the voice of man. Except the ones who speak as an oracle of God. And you do not identify them by their voice. You recognize them by his word. You do not know that I am from God because of my voice. You recognize because of the fruits that I bear. That align with the message that I preach. And that was what was said concerning John the Baptist. Many people came to see the voice of him crying in the wilderness, but they failed to pay attention to the message that says, prepare ye the way of the Lord. We will no longer be bamboozled. We will no longer be hoodwinked because our light has come. And one of the things that we do know is that the voice of God for these times that we're in especially reserved for the ones who have a heart of understanding and that is the reason why repeatedly in the book of revelation the angels of the churches kept saying let him who has an ear hear what the spirit of the lord is saying unto the churches that first ear means let him who has the heart of understanding let them hear what the spirit of god is saying unto the churches the pharisees created a religion as a substitute for not having a word from God simply because it was easier to make something up than to abandon yourself at the foot of Sinai until you hear the voice of God. They chose to make something up in the meantime and that was not the first time. When Moses went to the mountain to obtain the mind of God in one of the more archaic forms just because God was starting us up gradually and helping us to understand that 
what he really wants to communicate is he wants to communicate his potency, his divine ability to write his laws upon our hearts. But because people did not get it, he decided to write some laws on a tablet of stone. And the reason why it was written into stone was because it was trying to help them understand that their hearts are stony. And that is the reason why he had to inscribe into it because that was not the original plan of God. The original plan of God was shared with us in the ministry of Isaiah. When God said to Isaiah, go and announce to the ones who know that I write my laws upon the hearts of men. Isaiah chapter 51 verse 7. I read that to us on Tuesday. But God showed them that I'm starting you from here, but this is not where I want you to end up. I'm just helping you you're like babies and we're trying to teach you alphabets trying to teach you vocabulary but this is not the way you're going to speak you know the way we talk to children sometimes you're like say mama mama if at 21 years old they show up and they're like mama Sheila Kenyatta you will not approve of them simply because they have carried on that which is supposed to have been left behind and that is the reason why people don't travel far because they carry too much weight too much baggage, things that should have been done away with. Paul was like, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child. He says, but now I put those things away. But the Pharisees, they were like the children of Israel. When Moses went to seek the face of God on Sinai, they waited and waited and they were like, we can no longer wait. Maybe God and Moses have decided to abandon us or maybe they got into an argument and destroyed one another. We don't know what this is about, but there is no God and there is no Moses. So what shall we do? We will make for ourselves another religion. And they brought together all of the golds that God gave to them with which they were meant to build the tabernacle and they used it to make for themselves a golden calf. And what we forget from history that is now putting people in bondage today is that the ones who cast the golden calf were supposed to be the high priest of the people the golden calf was not championed by some ignorant person it was not championed by some demonic person it was not championed by those of the occult the golden calf was made by Aaron that was supposed to be the high priest He missed his opportunity to have been included in the description of the Lord Jesus. You see how in Hebrews, when Jesus was being described as the high priest, they skipped over Aaron. And the author of Hebrews says that we have a high priest in Christ Jesus according to the order of Melchizedek. Some people have their names inscribed on many books that are selling on Amazon at the expense of having their names inscribed and hatched into the foundations of the New Jerusalem. God forbid that we inherit or gain the whole world and lose our souls. But here we are today, we know that men have done it in the past, created religion when they were supposed to be waiting for revelation. They did it at Sinai and they did it again. They tried to do it again at the Jordan. And when John was preaching, he stood and the Pharisees came. And when he saw them, they came looking sorry, but he saw through the religion. And he said to them, I'm not fooled by your acts. He said, just do yourself a favor. Make sure that you stop acting and start bearing fruits of righteousness. He said to them, he said, unless your repentance is evident with fruits, you have no part in what is coming. And why did I tell you that last week? I told you that last week because the Lord's revealed to me that we need to be on guard because many will come to us who are identifying to be the seeds of Abraham like the Pharisees who would claim to have come to appreciate the position that we have taken and it will be one of Satan's last attempts to dilute our message. They will come and they will try to identify with us but like Jesus, like John exposed the Pharisees and Jesus exposed them even further. Jesus said to them, you call yourself the sons of Abraham. He says, but I see you, you are nothing but brood of vipers. You are of your father, the devil. It is critical for us to at least be able to do that, be able to identify the ones who are with us and the ones who are against us. And the ones that the enemy has come to perform all kinds of gymnastics around us. Don't worry. You know how these things work. 
soon it will begin to make sense remember on the on the second or third of september i was here and i told you that i saw in a vision that a war was being concorded and i described to you the nature of that war if you're wondering Alan's done y'all a favor. He put a snippet of that on Instagram, dated the 5th of September. So it must have happened here two or three days before that time. So essentially, a month before the war that we now hear about in the news broke out in Israel. And that is the reason why, thank God, I didn't forget where I was coming from. You know, I told you that I do not pray for the world. But I pray for these ones, just like Jesus says. He says, of the ones that the Father has given to me, none shall be lost except for the son of perdition. And the reason why the son of perdition was lost was because he did not recognize the time he needed to sever ties with religious people. Judas lost it because he wouldn't stop following Caiaphas. Hmm. Let me say that again. If you don't know who Caiaphas was, Caiaphas was the high priest when Jesus was crucified. He was filled with the Spirit because the Bible says he prophesied. When he said, it is better for one to die than for all to die, the Bible says, how be it, he prophesied, being the high priest that year. The fact that he occupied the position of the high priest that year meant that he carried heavenly unction with which to function, but he used it instead for his own pleasure. I have come to warn you against Delilah today. Because the seductress is whatever voice tells you to put your pleasure above the will of God. Very clearly this afternoon, the Holy Spirit reminded me of a saying. He said to me, you are only done when the one who employs you says you are. Many husbands try to receive credit for whatever they do for their wives and for their family. Just because by their own assessment, they have done well. I've washed all the cars. I've cut all the grass. I even swept. That's your job, but I did it. When that little one was crying his face off, I made him sandwich. That's your job. I did it. I'm the same guy who goes out nine to five and make money and do overtime and do all of that. We, not we, some men out there commend themselves. The Bible says it is foolishness for you to toot your own horn, to give yourself a pat on the back. Jesus says heaven forbids it. In the parable that he told in the book of Luke, I believe chapter 17, he said, who is it amongst you that has a servant that comes in from a full day's work? Jesus said it was a full day's work. He has gone from morning till night and having come in the evening, decided to wash his hands and feet and sit and say, I have earned my rest. He said, who is it amongst you that will approve of that? He said, do you not say to that servant as soon as it walks in? Well done, but you still need to feed me. That was what Jesus says, not my words. Jesus said it. He said, and then when you are satisfied, then the servant can rest. But that is what is destroying the world today because you find people who are servants who come in and after they come in, they're like, you people aren't singing and dancing that I am here. Most of us, when we go out in service to other people, in service to our families, to our spouses, we expect for people to stand at the door when we come in, giving a bow. Welcome, you faithful servant. No, you are not done until they say you are done. Just imagine if you as a husband or a wife, you have that attitude wherein you continue to serve until the one that, high, the one that employs you, the one that you work for, says, okay, honey, you need to sit down now. And then you have to ask and say, are you sure there's nothing else to do? Imagine if we are all like that, with godly determination to outserve one another. Will we not all be full with joy that overflows? If I am dedicated to outserving my wife and my wife is dedicated to outserving me, because none of us works for himself or herself. We all work for God by serving other people. That was why Jesus says, whoever must be the greatest amongst you must learn to be the servant of all. 
You see, that attitude is destroying so many people. When the Holy Spirit said to me today, he says, you are not done until the one that hires you says you are done. The one that you are working for, because many people don't even know that the moment you say that I do, what you're saying is, I accept your employment. Now I work for you. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church that he gave himself for her. Jesus came and he says, I am at your service, even to the death. And that was the reason why he did not resist being crucified, because that was part of his service. I say that again to you today because the seductress is very active in the world. And one of the things that the seductress is doing in the world today is handing out fake rewards so that people turn their back away from the line and don't wait for Jesus to come and hand out the original reward. Do we not see today that many people do not know the difference anymore between reward and result? You see people who are doing all kinds of gymnastics in the name of God, having great results, and you're like, oh my God, God must be with them because no one does a thing like this unless God is with him. You know that that was what Nicodemus came to tell Jesus and he heard the gospel of his life. He came to impress Jesus saying, Jesus, we see your results. They're fantastic. He said, no one can do these things unless God is with him. Thinking that Jesus would say, oh, Nico, you can come in. What took you so long? You know, many of us would have said, Nico, Nico. By this time next year, I'll make sure you become the head of the Sanhedrin. I will make sure of it. Caiaphas is not doing a good job. Myself, my disciples, and the 5,000 that I'm about to give free sandwich to, they will vote Caiaphas out, and you will become the high priest. Many of us would have given commendation for commendation, whereas some commendations are temptations. Let me tell you something. Make Delilah not commend you to your destruction. What did Satan do to Jesus when he first showed up? He commended him if truly you are the son of God. When Delilah came to Samson, Delilah told Samson multiple times, what a mighty man you are. Even the last time you told us to bind you, we bound you and you broke it loose. How great thou art. And that's the reason why the man continued to fall for the seductress. I'm going to say this very quickly because there is more that I would love to share with you, but I know that I need to put some things out there so that you can have pointers with which to expose the seductress, the temptress, that voice that would tell you to choose saving your own life over doing the will of God. That voice that would tell you to accept the religious people when they show up without demanding fruits from them. That voice that would tell you that, oh, come on, look at their results. They've, they've tried. You need, to, you need to give them a commendation. No commendation until I see your fruit. You can identify as hardworking. I don't care. Remember that tree, the fig tree that identified as a fig tree but had no figs. It had no knobs. And what did Jesus say? Well, if you have no knobs, this is fake. This is religion. And he cursed it. And he said, whatsoever tree exists there, that does not bear fruit. My father will bring it down. He says, my father will uproot the tree. So Jesus did us a favor by cursing the tree so that the father would not have to come down at that particular point to uproot it. Because if he had, everything would have been completely destroyed. Oh, the mercy of God. How immaculate. The reality of it is this. We need to be fruit inspectors. I say this because the Lord has raised me up to warn you against the horde of the Pharisees. The brood of vipers because they are in the camp of the seductress right now being groomed, being styled and they're about to re be released into the world and their tongue is poisoned. How many people remember the prophecy that I gave a while ago and put it in the group today? when I was telling you that I saw false prophets with poison, with their tongues dipped in poison and sent out into the media. And that is the reason why when you look at all of the media stations now, all of the mainstream media, they're all saying the same thing. They all dip their mouth into that same bottle. I can still smell it. It stank when I was in that room. And that was what I shared with you that it was coming. And look at them today. Deception galore. 
Everywhere you turn, they will not tell you the truth about the masterminds behind the war. Jesus told us, he says, they will come. They will call themselves Jews who are not because they are of the synagogue of Satan. And what else did he call them? He called them warmongers. They cannot get enough of the wars. And when the Lord revealed to me the principality that is behind it, it reminded me of the same principality that I saw before the last election who looked like a woman and a man at the same time, an advanced race of, of, of human, perfect looking with everything looking as though it was geometrically measured. Ideally, what you would call beautiful. And the reason why I take my time to describe these things is because let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit is saying unto the churches. That video of September 3rd, fifth, which is probably the third or the fourth was the actual live recording, I told you that Satan has gotten up again and he has shape-shifted into an angel of light. Y'all need to go and watch that video again because that was the first thing I said. I was in the middle of a sermon and I stopped and I stood right here because I, I, I needed to tell you what I was saying. I said he has once again shifted his shape into an angel of light. And what he is getting ready to do is to create a staring, a war. To weaken the resolve of the ones who have no faith. To sedate the ones that are still too powerful for the Pharisees to overcome. So that when the Pharisees come, they will just eat them for supper. Like they did to Judas. But I stand here today by the grace of God with a word from God to let you know let me tell you those three things very quickly. And I pray that, you know, the Lord would allow for you to know how they connect in your heart. Let nobody fool you with commendations. If they're not the ones who have assigned you to the work of the ministry, to the work of the kingdom, their commendation means nothing. The only commendation you want to hear is thou good and faithful servant, come into the rest of your Lord. Heaven's commendation only, nothing more, no more, no less. And the way God has trained us to not care about the commendation of men is because God allowed for some men to come ahead who slandered us, who insulted us, who reproached us so that we can divorce ourselves completely from their opinion. So that the day they bring the commendation of death in the voice of Delilah, we will smile and say that we are not fooled by your commendation. We are looking out for your fruits and as long as you have no fruits, we know who you represent. Test every spirit. Thank you that you may know that which is of God. We have to be on guard. I'm telling you these things because there are people around you who are feeding their spirit constantly on the news. And if you allow yourself to listen to them more than you should, Evil communication, the Bible says, corrupts good manners. So they're coming and the reason why you cannot allow them to stay is because they are coming in the spirit of Delilah. And what is the meaning of Delilah? Let me encourage you. When sometimes when you see things and you don't know what it is, just ask the Holy Spirit. He has been given to you by God. Jesus says, Ask the Father and he will send the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. And when he has come, he will bring to your remembrance all of what I have said. He will not reveal anything of his own. He will only reveal that which is in the heart of the Father. And he will guide you in all things. He will be your comforter and he will be the paraclete, the one that is called to be alongside with you. He is alongside with you, your paracleto, so that you don't have to yell before you hear him. You don't have to scream before you ask him. Ask him, because I asked the Holy Spirit when he said to me, he said to me, he said, look at Samson and Delilah. And that should be your, strat your plan and your strategy to overcome in this season. And I'm like, well, thank you for the advice, but why Samson and Delilah? He says, the names. I'm like, oh, okay, the names. What does Samson mean? Samson is what? Shim Shoni, that's the name. And that's where we get the word shimmering, to shine. And we, get, we got the word shown, which is to shine because shim shown means like the sun. That which shines like the sun. In, it has the power to illuminate. It's got majesty. Samson came and it was like the sun. But what brought him down was who? Who brought him down? Delilah. What is the meaning of Delilah? 
Delilah means that which is feeble. The one that is feeble. And you know what it means to be feeble in the last days? It means to be blown away by every wind of doctrine. You are feeble. You don't know what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. So when in the news they're telling you that certain people are attacking certain other people, instead of you to find out, Lord, where are you in all of these things and where should I be? You're like, oh, that pastor said everybody should pray for Israel. Oh, that pastor says that we need to pray that demons will go and destroy Palestine. Those are feeble people. They are blown away by every wind of doctrine because they have only learned to live on bread alone, but not by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus didn't just pray for everybody at random. Even though he came to die for the world, John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. When it became critical mass, that very, those very last hours, he did not waste his prayer on everybody. And he made it very clear when he showed up in the presence of the Father. He says, I have come not to pray for the world, but just to pray for these ones that you have given to me. And he was very strategic. He says, you don't take them out of the world. Keep them where they're at. Because prophecy has to be fulfilled. Their eyes have to behold the reward of the wicked. So they need to be here because someone says, but if I'm in heaven, I can behold what's going down on the earth. The Bible made it very clear that a thousand will fall at your side and ten thousands at your right hand. So they're not going to fall just beneath you. They will fall around you. The wheat and the tears are standing together and the tears have to be uprooted. Jesus was not miscalculated. He was very guided. In the wisdom of God, he says, do not take them out. The need to have the fullness of promise fulfilled. Their eyes will be older the world of the wicked. He said, but I want you to seal them. Cover them where they're at. Egypt was not destroyed after Israel left. Egypt was destroyed while Israel was still there, but they remained under the seal of the blood. That is the reason why the Lord said to us, that we should not listen. He told us through the ministry of Jeremiah that we should not listen to the ones from amongst us who say to us not to worry that we're about to return to the land of our promise. He says, do not listen to them. He says, stay where you're at and obey the king that you may live. Here is the word of the Lord to you today. The feeble ones are about to be introduced into conversations everywhere you go in the workplace because they will be the ones to come to you. They will seek you out. Like they sought out John the Beloved. I mean, John the Baptist. They will seek you out. Like Satan sought Jesus out. They will seek you out. You need to be the ones to recognize the moment they begin to say there is a casting down. <laughs> the moment they begin to speak out of the flesh. The moment they begin to campaign for the false prophet and the antichrist. The moment they begin to sound as an angel of light who is speaking the fables out of a religious they're singing to a religious crow. And I was told to tell you about that as well because some of their words are going to be musical. They're, they're intended to not just serenade but to hypnotize. The way they will string it all together. The Lord is saying you need to silence them because if Samson had silenced Delilah, his ministry would have gone a different way. The reason why he became weak was because he kept listening to her. Because that which you listen to is what you become ultimately. How does that work? Words create images. And when you see a thing, what you behold is what you become. I want to tell you a little bit about the criticality of what I am sharing. So that you can take it with you as a weapon of mass destruction with which to bring down the gates of Hades. When you look at the ministry of Peter, Peter was once a feeble man. He was once a man that was blown by every wind of doctrine. He was neither here nor there. You know, that was why Jesus would refer to him as Simon, the son of Jonah. Simon bar Jonah. The word Simon means to hear. And so all he did was everywhere there was something, oh, they said this here, we're going there. Oh, they said this. And then when he finally woke up and started to operate not by bread. What is bread? I told you that bread is that which others have made and served to you. Their packaged revelation. That is bread. It doesn't have to be bad. In fact, most breads are good. But the reality of it is you have been told not to live by bread alone. 
but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So anybody that keeps giving you bread without teaching you how to bake your own and how to obtain fresh revelation from God is only feeding you to slaughter you. I've shared this with you before, but I'm going to say it again. If they keep feeding you without teaching you how to receive from God directly, they're feeding you for Satan. They're getting you fattened so that when the time comes, they will be able to parade you as sheep led to the slaughter to their master. But I say to you today, learn from Peter. I want you to truly get the story of Peter. So I'm going to tell you the three things, some of the three things that I have said or three of the things that I have said. Again, I told you that religious people are coming. And I'm not just talking about walking in through these doors. I'm talking about coming into your DMs, coming into the comments on the post, coming into your, associate, your, 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 your partnership meetings, your business meetings, just about anywhere where God has positioned you to baptize people unto repentance. Anywhere that the Lord has sent you, they are coming. Thank you, Jesus. You see, sometimes I, I prophesy over people and they're not ready for it. And I've been, I've been, I've been cautioned by the Lord. And I've told you that, in fact, I preached a message about it once before, giving examples, not mentioning names, but giving examples of people that the Lord showed to me that came to communion house at the beginning, that received the prophetic word, and they were not ready for it, but I was just so generous to give it, and I had an expectation for them to have an accelerated growth because it's a promise of God that our steps can be quickened unto righteousness, but they were too obsessed with Egypt, and they were too obsessed with the things of Sodom and Gomorrah to allow themselves to grow quickly to measure up to the prophetic word that they have received and it, 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 it wounded them. The same word that was supposed to do them good, they overran, they went ahead of the giver of the word and it destroyed many people. It destroyed many people. And so since then I've been cautious. And recently, sometime this week, the Holy Spirit reminded me of that again. It was just there in my subconscious that, okay, don't just dump it. Allow for there to be a connection first. And once there's a connection, let the person lay a demand. Let them draw so that you're not just pouring fresh wine over covered cups. If you take fresh wine and you're pouring it onto a cup that has a lid on it, guess what happens? Everything gets wasted. And that is not how to be a faithful servant. Because how do I go back and say, well, the wine you gave me, I've already given it out. And they will ask me, how did you give it? Because we haven't seen the result of it. You understand what I mean? And so I'm learning not to pour it out. And that is exactly what just happened here today. I started telling you about a man in here or a woman who has been saying, why the dirt? Why the dirt? Why the dirt? I started saying it, but you didn't pull from me enough until I said, the seductress is coming and that the religious people are coming. Suddenly, I heard your voice again. Saying, keep saying that thing you were saying about dirt. So I'm going to tell you now that you're ready. Praise God for your life. Joshua. Well done. And so here is the deal. And that's got me, by the way. Praise God. So, <laughs> the reality of it is the reason for the dirt is because the Lord's called you and sent you. You are an apostle. And when I say the word apostle, I don't want you to think about the ones who put that on flyers and on Facebook. I'm not talking about everybody who sees it as a distinction to put themselves at a the level higher than a pastor. So when they invite them with, to events with other pastors, they look and everyone is pastor, pastor. They're like, can you change mine to apostle? Remember, because when we were growing up, that was what it was. Everybody gets to become deacons and then they were brothers and then deacons and then ministers. And then when you become a pastor, then no one can talk to you anyhow. And then after a while, when everyone is becoming a pastor, the pastor who ordained them now has to become a reverend. And one day I asked one of the people who was very vast in, in such liturgy, I said, do you know where reverend came from? And he didn't know. I'm like, oh, show me reverend in your Bible. No, no, you can't find it. I said, look, I, I used to wonder too. And so I went to study the order. And what I realized was the Roman army had hierarchy. And part of what they did was when they hijacked 
Christianity from the last of the apostles and they merged it with their sun worship and all of that, all those, all those images that they had spent hundreds of years and thousands of years carrying from civilization to civilization, they didn't want to destroy them. They just changed the name. They said that one will be Mary, this one will be Jesus. But the reality of it is that everything that is happening there is contrary to the word the word of God says. The word of God says you shall not make an image that you bow to, not of things on hev in heaven, neither of things on the earth. Every time you see God raising prophets, one of the things that God raises prophets to do is to call out idols. And the reason being, there is an injunction out of the mouth of God, the Lord of all spirits, that came into the life of Abraham. The Lord said to Abraham, as you are, so shall your descendants be. And Abraham came into the ministry because he did not believe in idols. He was persecuted by Nimrod. He was thrown into the den of lions. And that is the reason why prophets that have come after that have been thrown into the den of lions generation after generation. Even though they don't physically throw us into the den of lions anymore, they throw us into WhatsApp groups where people bastardize our names or try to, where people try to tear us into pieces. But you see, it is an injunction by God. And it started with Abraham. Abraham came into prominence as a man of God after he left the house of Noah, where he was raised under the tutelage of Shem because he went to his father's house and he saw that his father was bowing down to Sumerian idols and he pushed them down and he told his father, he says, Father, your idols are taking a nap. Did you overwork them the night before? And the father was like, you know they can't take a nap. And he was like, they are, they're all on their faces and the food that you put there is all scattered and they can't even eat it. They're too tired. And the father was like, dude, you did this. And it was like, I'm a man. How can I push down the God? They drove him out. He came back. The reason why we need to know those things is because they've hidden those things from us because they don't want us to be confident in who we are when God has called us to the office of a prophet. Because you look around and you don't look like anyone that they're telling you you should look like. You need to go back and see the ones who started this race with God. They call out idols wherever they see idols. Even look at the Ten Commandments. He says, you shall not have any brazen image. You shall not bow before any other God. And so anyway, story for another day. When it was time to compel people to bow to idols and to come into the regimentation of their religious worship, they needed hierarchy to police people. So that when you are below this person, you just have to listen to them regardless of if you agree with them. Religion happens by force. Whereas faith happens by conviction. The Bible says, let everyone be fully persuaded within himself, not beaten to submission with a rod. And I told him, I said, look at history. You see, the first time they introduced the word reverend, it's supposed to be the equivalent of a governor whose sole responsibility is to tax the people and bring the results to the superior. And I said, I can prove that to you. The moment we started calling people reverend ministers, the rate at which our focus on money went up was unparalleled and unprecedented. I said, simply because we took a title from a temple of mammon that was supposed to tax the people. So we, collect, we receive tithes and offerings as though it is taxes, compelling people to give grudgingly and out of necessity instead of cheerfully as they have proposed in their hearts because the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. We keep taking on titles and things from the world and we wonder why we're poisoned in the body. Because you took poison, you cannot be fellowshipping with the brood of vipers and not be struck. You cannot. You will be struck. The Bible says, can a man take fire into his bosom and not be burnt? That is what we have done. Anyway, if you, we, we are thank God this is coming on us. We don't care about those things. You have been called to be an apostle, not as a title for aggrandizement, but you have been called an apostle because to be an apostle means to be one that is sent. And that is the reason why I am thankful to God because you're, you're pulling at the prophetic. So I'm going to tell you exactly where you're at so that you can continue to where you need to be. The reason why you have found yourself in dirt time and time again in your thoughts. It begins in your thoughts. You try to think of holy things, but you find yourself thinking about things that are unholy. And you find yourself making mistakes, the same mistakes again and again. And you keep falling into dirt. And you're like, why do I keep falling into dirt? The Lord said, because he's called you 
to be an apostle. And for you to be an apostle, to go where you have been sent, your eyes have to be opened. Jesus personally opened the eyes of the 11, the 12. One of them decided to cover his eyes again. But then when he was raising the 13th apostle, what was the beginning of the ministry of Saul? Blindness. After he saw Jesus, he was struck with blindness. Well, not like he was struck with blindness. His blindness was revealed. He was blind, but he did not know. He was blinded by passion without direction. He was blinded by activity without what? Without the right intentionality. And God revealed that. And so Ananias had to come to open his eyes. Correct? Until then, he couldn't be an apostle. Jesus already set the precedent for that when a blind man was brought to Jesus who was born blind. And Jesus looked at him and he wanted to set up a model for what it means to be an apostle. How many people remember that story? Jesus made mud from the dust. He spat into the ground and he made a mess. He spat into the ground, made a mess, and he covered his eyes with the mess. And they said to him, now you go to the pool of Siloam. And it is by translation, sent. Siloam is to be sent. Is another word for apostle. And because God called him to go, to be sent, to be an apostle, his eyes needed to be opened. And God used the mud and the dirt to open his eyes. The reason why you have been falling and falling and falling is because God wants to give you a vision that is pure. It is a contrasting system wherein God is contrasting where you are at against where you need to be. You are about to walk in the light, but it needs you to know the dirt. Know the dirt to the point wherein if anybody tries to disguise dirt as light, you will know. Because you will say to them, do you know how long I spent with my face in the mud? And now that I have gone where the Lord has sent me, I am no longer blind, now I see. So I say to you that in the mighty name of Jesus, you will begin to receive the grace to forgive yourself. You will receive the grace to stop beating yourself up. You will receive the grace. You are receiving it right now as the word of the Lord is coming forth to let yourself rise from the dung hill and to lift up your eyes on the way to Siloam and begin to see. The Lord is sending you. You're an apostle, but you're also a seer. And if you let him finish what he has started with you, then we'll call you a prophet. So I declare that over you today and I'm glad because you have laid a demand on the unction and the unction has answered you. You will never be the same again. You know who you are because you have gone to the Lord of late and you have said to him, like Paul said, this thing that troubles me, take it away from me. And Paul says three times, I sought the Lord and the Lord did not take it. So I've learned to live with it as a messenger of Satan that is a thorn in my flesh that continues to buffet me that I may stay humble. Did you get it? That I may stay what? Humble. How do you humble people? Sackcloth and ashes. You cover them with dirt. All of that dirt is because God wants to humble you. So that eventually when you begin to see, you will not take that honor unto yourself. I am excited today because... I know for the Lord has shown to me when the testimony of this man is shared, when the tale of his deliverance is brought to the world, many will marvel and say this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our sight. And it would be my joy to have been an oracle in the life of such a one that the Lord has raised up from the dung hill to be a light to generations. When that word of the Lord came to me that that man will be a light unto generations, I was like, is he going to live from generation to generation, and the Holy Spirit said to me, that's because you keep thinking of generation in one way. And I'm like, generation means generation. My generation, my son's generation, my father's generation. And he said to me, are you arguing or do you want to learn? I said, I want to learn. He says, go and look at the word generation. What does it mean? Do you know the word generation in the Hebrew language 
is the word door. D-O-R. That's where we got the English variation of it that is called door. The word generation means a place where people dwell. A generation in terms of an age group of people and it could also literally mean the door to an habitation. And so when the Lord says from generation to generation, wherever you see that in your Bible, from generation to generation, yes, it means from generation to generation, which is different age groups and epics of people, but it also means from door to door. Jesus lived as a man in one generation of people. He came in, he was there only 33 and a half years, 33 and a third years. But prophecy was fulfilled that it would be a blessing from generation to generation. And how did that happen? He took of his spirit, he put it on the apostles and he said to them, go from where? Door to door. <laughs> I knew this was going to happen tonight. But don't worry. I believe it's been recorded and by the grace of God, nothing will tamper with that recording so that you can watch it again and start to put the pieces together. So now let me go back to what I was saying about Peter and how the life of Peter is a model that will save us in the times that we're in from the great deception that is being perpetrated by the seductress. Remember that when I prophesied, I told you that the angel, that Satan will come and disguise himself as an angel of death. And I saw that principality that incited one army against the up against another but the reality of it was that both armies were fighting with the same weapons i specifically told you weapons because the lord said to me don't miss that detail i said the aircraft of this side looked like the aircraft of that side they won't tell you this in the news but i tell you that these wars have been fought with weapons supplied by the same entity. And the people who are behind it are in servitude to that principality. I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what do we do? He said, tell them to keep the flame burning. He said, because I will come to them at night. Keep the flame burning. He will come to you at night in, the, in a way that you would recognize. But you have to be able to see him when he comes. So what does it mean to keep the flame burning? The Bible says the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord with which the Lord searches the inward part of the belly. The Lord is saying when you sleep, your spirit is not sleeping. Even when you're asleep, even when you're doing quick books, even when you're writing proposals, don't allow yourself to be lost in the mundane. Let a part of you stay awake for the Lord because it will come to you in the middle of the night and it will speak to you plainly you see the things that i am saying to you before i left the house today the lord said to me he said you are still speaking as you have been speaking by design and that is why you see that i'm not prophesying and calling the names of countries when i'm prophesying but i'm giving the scriptures of things that you can use to recognize them because i am of the order of daniel when it comes to such prophetic utterances so that no one can take that honor unto himself but for you who is still asking questions the lord is saying keep the flame burning i will come to you and he will come to you all righty so that's another nugget for you save that in the file not the one that you put on the shelf, but the file that you put under your armpit so that you can quickly work on it before you forget. All right? That is, that is that. Let it be in your outbox, not in some kind of folder that you file away. So let's go back to the feeble Delilah and how you can safeguard yourself against Delilah because we have an example of Delilah in the New Testament that God helped and did not perish. And that was Simon, who was also feeble. And when Jesus told him, 
what happened in the presence of God. And I want to encourage you, read your Bible a lot because one of the things that my wife and I we've been talking about lately is that sometimes I'm just telling you stories and giving you accounts from scripture and some people have not even heard the story before. Like when I was talking about Balaam and Balak, some people were just looking at me like, yeah, this must be from the Lord of the Rings, maybe. <laughs> Sorcery? Sorcerer? No. I'm talking about people watching online. The people here are Bible scholars. Praise the Lord. They love the Word of God. So I would take my time to explain this one a little bit today. So if, in case you don't know, Peter was one of the disciples of Jesus. And one day, Jesus was with the Father because Jesus took all of his instructions from the Father. He says, the things that I do are the things that I see my Father do and the words that I say are the words that he says. And that's why when everybody's sleeping at night, he withdraws to the mountains because the people already said they didn't want to see God again. And so when God comes, he doesn't come all the way to the ground. He stays somewhere up there. So Jesus will go and meet with him and they will observe and he will see the Father live through the day. You see, because actions speak, I mean, I mean pictures speak more, uh, contain more than a thousand words. How do they say that? Um, a picture is better than a thousand words. Okay. So there are times wherein the Father isn't interested in telling you too many things. He just models it for you. He just does it. So you see it and then you can do the same. And that's why Jesus was following everything that he saw the Father doing. And on one of those occasions, when he was with the Father, Satan came also to receive his next assignment. And so he came to the Father as he would, saying, well, I've been going to and fro upon the earth. You got something for me? You got work? And, and when he came, his next assignment was supposed to be who? Peter. Remember that there was a time his assignment was Job. There was a time that his assignment was Jesus and he was enjoying the ministry that he was assigned to to tempt Jesus so much so that he didn't want to stop. And Jesus was like, that's enough now. Get thee behind me, O Satan. Samson was supposed to have said the same thing to Delilah, but he didn't. So that's why you cannot entertain the Pharisees when they come because when you entertain the feeble-minded, when you entertain the ones whose minds have been corrupt, who are speaking out of a debased mind, they will create a debased picture and what you behold, you become. So you need to learn how to shut people down and how to cut them off. The Bible says to cut things off in righteousness, right? And so when Jesus was there, Satan came and he was like, oh, Peter is my next target. And Jesus was listening and he told the father, he says, I know what I want to do with Peter. Peter is Simon. He moves by everything that comes in here. He's indiscriminate about all of what he hears. And so I'm going to keep swifting him as wind, toe and fro, until I can blow him off as a chaff. And Jesus heard that. And so Jesus came back to the ground and called Peter. He says, Peter? He says, Simon? Simon. Simon was like, what is it this time? He says, Satan has asked to sift you as wind. He said he has asked. This time around, it's not even going to happen by accident. The fact that he has asked means he has some level of authorization and then he will go and prepare his strategy. So Jesus told Lucifer, I mean, uh, told Peter, Simon, he says Satan has asked to sift you as wind, but I have prayed for you. Ladies and gentlemen, Satan has asked to sift us as wind. But Jesus has prayed for us. Jesus prayed for Peter, but Peter still denied Jesus. So this is what we have to do different. Peter was a man who had found a secret. And the reason why he, was, he denied Jesus was because he did not value that secret as he should. I don't blame him. He didn't have the Holy Spirit in the measure that we do. Because with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is there. The Bible says to bring to your remembrance. Because God knows that in the fallen state that we are as men, we forget the things that are important. And that's why Jesus says, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. If you would remember the way God came through for you the last time you were in trouble, will you ever be afraid again? No, the reason why you're afraid and Satan is able to rob you of your joy for six hours in the morning is because you forget that great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. It's because we forget that God is good. We forget that he's thought toward us and not of evil but of good to give us a future and a hope. We forget that he is for us and not against us. If you will never forget that all things work together for your good, then no disappointment will come and leave you devastated. 
No disappointment. Because you would always know that, you know what, this thing might look like a disappointment, but it is just another opportunity for heaven to show up for me in a bigger way. And then you will shake off the beast into the fire and begin to sing your song again. You will be able to do that. Last night I was in meditation and suddenly I heard my wife, she started to pray. And when she started praying, I was like, this is interesting. This tone of voice, it went from zero to 60 in just two seconds. I said, what is going on? The Holy Spirit said, you want to see? I said, yes, and he showed me. He said, we have just given her an update. We revealed to her certain things concerning you and she got angry in the spirit that that is even the plan of the enemy for her husband. And that is the reason why she raised her voice in intercession. I said, thank you, Jesus. Now me, I can continue doing what I'm doing because I have help. <laughs> Hallelujah. Say to your neighbor, you have help. You are Lazarus. Lazarus means the one who has help. So, I tell you all of these things. Wow, okay. Praise the Lord. Let's just quickly go through Peter and leave Delilah for now. You get a lot of the Delilah stuff out of Peter. So, Peter had a secret, but he forgot the potency of that principle. And what was the principle? I have told you this before, but the Holy Spirit impressed upon my heart that I needed to remind you of it because it has become more critical than ever before for us to recognize the power of the spoken word. Of every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. When Peter started his journey, he started his journey as the brother of Andrew. And Andrew was who? Was a disciple of John the Baptist. Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist who was there the day John said to his disciples, he said, come. And specifically, the Bible says that John summoned Andrew to tell him, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist was flesh and blood. Jesus said he was a man born of woman. And he revealed to Andrew that Jesus was the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And Andrew turned around and looked at Peter. And what did he say to Peter? He said, Peter, come here. We have found him who is called the Christ. Did John tell him he was going to be called the Christ? John didn't. John told him, this is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That was the bread that man gave him. But he didn't just live by that bread alone. He sought the Lord for himself and received revelation. That for this to be the lamb, he must also be the Christ. The Christ means the anointed one. They learned that from the prophecies of Enoch. Because Enoch says, behold, I saw seated upon the throne, the one that has been elected by God. To be anointed means to be prepared for election. Or to be elected for unction. And so they knew right away, he made the connection. It was like, wait a minute. If this is the lamb, he must be the Christ. And so the day Jesus asked his disciples, saying, who do men? And I want you to listen very closely because I want you to get this. Please, it is important. If you're waiting extra time, and some of you will miss Chick-fil-A tonight because they would, may have closed by the time we're done, let it be worth something. That show on television, you may miss it tonight. That ex-boyfriend that you, have, you want to have sympathy on and talk to on the phone today, you may miss that tonight. But I tell you, I don't want you to miss the power of this principle. Because we're at war and you need all the artillery that you can find. I want you to think about what I am saying to you today as a debrief from an army general of the strategy with which we will take more territory from Satan. So when it is that important, you take it to heart. Jesus said to his disciples, or 12 of them. He says, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Sister Z, will you say that that was a trick question? In a way, it was. Because if Jesus asks you, I know you today. And the reason why I am saying I know you today is because the Lord revealed you to me one day. And you had your hand on a button and you kept pressing that button. And the Lord said to me, that is her always pinging. 
waiting to hear what the Spirit is saying. You see? And so if he says to you, you, you that I know based on what I have seen, that who do men say that I the son of man am? Do you know what her answer would be today because of the relationship that she has built with the Holy Spirit? She would have said, but Jesus, I don't listen to men. <laughs> and Jesus would have said, well done. Because I am the good shepherd and my sheep know my voice. Do you know that the origin of the word know means to wait, to be told. When, Joseph was, when Joshua was waiting on Jesus, okay, that was Jordan. When, jo when Joshua was waiting on Moses, <laughs> he was waiting to hear what Moses has heard from God. That is the origin of the word to know. So if you want to know, if you want to hear, you have to be attentive. You have to constantly be pinging. And so Jesus said, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And because of the fact that they were still, you know, in school, they were not apostles yet. They said, some say that you're a prophet. Some say that you're a teacher. In fact, one of them felt like he knew more than everybody else. He said, some say that you are Elias who is to come. And Jesus was like, Elias, which is Elijah, that's John. I mean, what are you talking about? Like, this is me. You understand what I mean? And you know what happened? Peter spoke. Brother Ron, our dear brother Peter spoke. And he says, you are Christ. And Jesus was like, okay, not bad. I know where you got that from. Because John told Andrew that he was the lamb. Andrew told Peter that he was the Christ. So Peter started with what they handed to him. And then he went on to say, son of the living God. And Jesus was like, okay. He says, now that one, flesh and blood, did not reveal that to you. But my father that is in heaven. What is Jesus establishing? Jesus is establishing for us that the bread that you receive from people is intended to condition your taste for the voice of God. What you hear from here is supposed to condition your taste so that when you have that hunger and thirst, you shall be filled directly by heaven. That is why it is important for you to spend time with God, spend time in his presence seeking so that you may know, for the Bible says he knows who keeps pinging to know. He knows who follows to know. So what I am saying to you is this, how do we immune ourselves to the deception that is here? To the seductress. The seductress's name is called Delilah. Delilah is feeble. To be feeble means to be tossed about by every wind of doctrine. Not having received a tethering to heaven directly yourself. You're blown about by everything that is terrestrial when you have yet to have a connection with the celestial. And so what did Jesus establish? He said to Peter, he said, Peter, that time he called him Peter. He says, you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not be prevail against it. Why did Jesus call Peter the rock when Jesus himself is the rock of ages? The reason I put it to you folks is that whatever it is that you behold, you become. The moment Jesus was seen by Peter as the son of God, the Bible says for as many as have received him as the son of God, even to those who believe on his name, have we given the power to become the sons of God. When you have a revelation of Jesus, you become that revelation that you have. And that is the only way by which the devil cannot call a triangle a square because you are not walking based on what you are hearing. You are basing your conclusions on that which is coming from the hotline that is passworded. 
which is the communica communication between your heart and the heart of your heavenly father. In these last days, the only way by which we're not going to be deceived is if we have learned to savor the bread that has been given to us by the teachers and the prophets and use that to develop our taste bud to be able to recognize the words that are coming from our heavenly father so that when everything gets shut down and the phones become brick once again, you will continue to function because you will hear God. Hear me what I say. I do not speak in parables this time, but I speak plainly. Once again, the stones will be stones again. The phones will be stone again. And when there is nobody to tell you this or that, how will you operate? We're going to have our own Lazarus experience. We're in for four days and for four nights we will be buried. Lazarus was buried behind stone walls which means he could not hear what was going on on the outside. They're getting ready to cut us off. To isolate us. So that whatever we have been nursing on the inside, we have an opportunity to deal with us. If you have been nursing the presence of God on the inside of you, the Holy Spirit will comfort you. But if you have been nursing fear and greed and lusts on the inside of you, when they shut everything down, that beast will come out and it will consume you. So be careful what you nurse within you. That's why Jesus says, if the light in you be darkness, how deep is that darkness? Because Jesus knows that one day, the beast from the abyss is coming. I say this to you today, folks, that when that time comes, regardless of what you have access to or don't, you will not lose access to heaven. So when Jesus was taken away from them, Peter denied Jesus because he found the connection, but he hung up. The moment you find that connection in the days to come, don't let go. Ada, if you find the heart of intercession in the coming weeks, don't stop. If you find joy just singing old choruses from the 90s, don't stop. Whatever it is that you find, if you find a rhythm in studying the Word of God, do not stop. Simply because it has been given to you to know the things of God. And once you know those principles, don't stop. Peter had bread that was given by flesh and blood, but he allowed himself to be elevated to hear directly from God that this is the Son of God. Nobody ever told him that Jesus was the Son of God. No flesh and blood. Jesus said, but my father which is in heaven. And so when you find your rhythm in Christ through the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, do not let go. Do not faint, but pray without ceasing. We're going to break bread today and we're going to go to the book of Luke chapter 17, verse 19. And we're going to devour that word. Because you know what it is? The word is embers. And when you eat the embers, which is the coal from the altar, it will illuminate you. It will activate you. It will purify you. And the Bible said, and he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. As we eat of the Lord's body today and drink of his blood, May we be reminded that we are the ones that have been asked to go. May we be reminded that we are the ones that have been sent to the pool of Siloam. May we be reminded that we are the ones whose eyes have been opened because the Lord has sent us to the place of clarification. And when we get there, our faith will make us whole. But we need to be able to see where we're going. As we break bread today, I want you to say that, Lord, you have asked me to rise, I arise. You have asked me to go, I go. And Lord, I thank you because you opened the eyes of the blind. Let me see where you want me to go. Because you lead me in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. And the moment your eyes of understanding are open, then you begin to go deep and deeper and you begin to go deep and deep and deep into the message that God has for you for the world for others for the body in the mighty name of Jesus 
let eyes be opened in this place by the love of the one who gave himself for us. Father, we thank you because your love never fails. And in that love, and by that love, and in the name of that love that was personified in the Messiah, let eyes be opened in here. May we from where we stand, where the seal is, may we from this pedestal lift up our eyes and see the angels of the throne. May we from here look up and see without limitation. Look around and see without inhibition. May our eyes be open that we may go and be made whole in the name of Jesus. Anything that is blocking you, whatever blockade to your ears that may be stopping you from hearing, let such blockade dis dissolve. Right now in the mighty name of Jesus, let the stones be rolled away. And now hear the name that which the Lord calls you. Hear it in his voice. He is calling you Lazarus to arise. May we let us go ahead and eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood. As we do so in remembrance of him. Father, we thank you because you have not revealed these things to the learned ones, but you have chosen to reveal to the ones who have chosen to stay at your feet. Father, we do not take this honor unto ourselves, but we give you glory because we will not walk in the dark because we are of the light. We walk in the light where it is day in the mighty name of Jesus. I'm going to say something to you guys. I told you that there was a special announcement coming our way today. What you do not have, you cannot give. There is a mandate that we have received which I will share with you today in case you haven't picked up on it. By the grace of God, in the month of November, we will have an event that is titled No Slumber November. Praise the Lord. When I saw it, I saw it boldly written, No Slumber November. It was on display on the screen. It was a green and black background. And it says, No slumber November. And the Lord said to me, Now that you have been helped, go and help others. When Jesus restored Peter, what did he say to Peter? He says, Now that you have been helped, go and help others. Now that you have been found, you have been restored. Go and help others. The Lord is saying he wants us to bring others in here that they may be awakened in their spirit because people's eyes are shut and their minds are dull. When the Lord says to us to watch and pray, people are not watching and they're not praying and you know who they are. When you hear them speak, you can tell that they have not been with the Lord lately. When you see them panic, you know that they do not see the outer circle of the host of heaven that surrounds the army of Syria. You know that they're afraid because they do not see. You know that they're confused because they're not watching and you know that they're not praying. The onus is on us to bring them in in the window that we have so that they also can be ignited as we, as we have been. Today's message and by the grace of God, the ones to follow are in, intended to activate us. So that when they come, it is not just what they hear from the pulpit. It is just by standing next to you that some of them will be activated. We're going to make flyers. We may even make t-shirts. We will invite people. We will go to the highways and to the byways. And we will invite them to come and tell them with plain words that we're inviting you to come and revive your prayer life and to have your eyes open. 
We're not going to tell them, praise the Lord, to come for coffee. We're not going to tell them to come and make friends. We're telling them to come for the Word and the Spirit. And nothing more, nothing less. There is an activation that has gone on. I will take the liberty and share a little bit about Justin's testimony. Justin, I told him one day that I prayed for him that the Holy Spirit will come upon him mightily and that he will speak with another tongue and that he needs to do certain things. I told him, I said, you need to study the Word of God. You need to build capacity. And he's been studying the Word of God. And now on Tuesday, he came up here and the Lord shared with me a vision concerning him. I didn't see that vision until he came. And when he came, the Lord showed me the vision. And what did I tell him? I said, the Lord is about to give you a tool, a remote control with which you are able to change that TV channel so that others around you can see what the Lord is showing you. Maybe that night, was it that night or the night after? The night after, while Alan was leading the prayer online, the, the prayer that most of, most of the people here don't come to, because it's usually just a handful of people who come to it, you know. Night watch. I mean, second watch. Because, no, it's the second watch, not the third watch. Yeah, okay, Wednesday, yeah. It's the second watch. Because the man of God, Alan, had a vision from God that we come here on Tuesdays and we are watching because we're watchers. We're watchmen. <laughs> we're watchmen. Yeah. Some people knew what just happened there, but no. If you, if you missed it, it's okay. We're watchmen, and we keep a second watch. And while second watch was going on, this man of God received his remote control. He started to speak in tongues. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And did your mom not join you in speaking in tongues? In praying together? When he shares the testimony, you will hear more of the reason why it is important that his mother joined him because it was clear from the vision. I didn't tell you all, but when he came to me afterwards, he was like, what are the details of the vision? And I told him. And by the grace of God, within about 24 hours, it was fulfilled. Why am I saying what I am saying? Including our dear sister who prophesied all the way from the UK. I say those things because there is an outpouring and it is to ignite you. Arise. Go. You see, because the moment you go, you begin to glow. And when you glow, you can enlighten others. And that is what will take hell out completely. Because the Bible says these lights will shine and the darkness will not comprehend it. I am trying so aggressively tonight to contain my excitement simply because some of you are about to discover who you really are. I'm sorry, what you really are. Just um, remember to stay humble. God is good. Alrighty, we have broken bread. Who's doing the announcements tonight? Is it Chris, Kayla, or my wife? Chris is doing the announcement. God is good. Well, before you come here, we're going to take the offering very quickly. I just want to um, help you with that, if that's okay, because I know that Highland probably was planning to do that. And so um, let us just, let's prepare our offerings. If you're bringing a tithe, if you have a commitment, an amount that you have committed, something that you are given cheerfully as you have proposed in your heart, please do not give, give because necessity is laid upon you. Give because your heart is responding and beating in generosity to the Lord of the work. Beating in generosity and in joy because God loves a cheerful giver. Are you joyful to support that which is going on in here? Are you joyful to give in his name? Are you joyful to fulfill your partnership commitment to the kingdom and in service to this house? If that is how you're giving tonight, the Lord receives you and we are glad to receive your offerings. We're glad to receive that which you bring in his name today in the name of Jesus. You see, communion house is a fertile ground. If in doubt, ask others. Or maybe even try it yourself. The word of God says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He says, try me and see. If you haven't given it a go, there is no way you can knock it. So I want to encourage you, let us be diligent in showing our confidence in the work and our commitment to the Lord of the harvest, even the Lord of the work. And so I'll give you a moment to write those checks, to log into those accounts. 
to do those text givings. Thank God for the people that have switched to Zelle. Um, we appreciate you greatly because there are no additional charges that are associated with that. I know some people have stayed on the other platforms and they cover the charges. God bless you also. Oh, oh praise the Lord. All righty, and I'm just going to read to us Psalms 38 as we prepare. You're multidimensional people. You can still be preparing and blessing and speaking and watering your seed and praying over your offering before you put it in while you listen to Psalms 38. And we'll just read maybe three verses for us real, for me, real quick. Psalms 3, 8. God is good. Yeah, so in, some of you may have noticed that the unction is coming at a different frequency of late. If you've noticed, that's good. If you haven't, I'm telling you now. There's been a switch in the frequency of the delivery of the unction of our communion house. If, you, if you're in doubt, go back like four weeks, listen to one of those messages, and go back to Tuesday and listen to that message. You will pick up on it. And the reason being, there are certain things that are being said to us now that are intended to awaken certain parts of us that we have not even seen in a long time or maybe before. So there's a reason for it. So pay attention. And, and if you don't know what it is, ask the Holy Spirit. I say, Holy Spirit, break this thing down to me. I need to know. Don't let him go until he blesses you. Don't let him go until you have received something. So we're just going to read Psalms 38 verse, verses 1 through 3 very quickly. Actually, 3 through 5. The Bible says there is no soundness in my flesh because of your anger nor health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. The word of the Lord says here that the man of God is restless because of what he has done. You know, when I say the man of God, I'm usually talking about David. He says, because of what I have done, he says, my sins have overwhelmed me. This is the word of the Lord to us that we should not allow anything to be more real to us than the love of God. Many of us, because the flesh is held captive by sin, we live in that realm and we wallow in condemnation. But when you come to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 51, Look at what it says in verse 8. Uh, not verse 8, verse 14. Yes, verse 14 of Isaiah 51. It says, The captive exile hastens that he may be loosed. What is the captive exile? Do you know? Your flesh. When, you're, when, you, when you were formed, you were formed for his glory. But because we were held captive by sin, what happened to us? We were exiled from the garden. Remember that Adam and Eve were exiled from the garden of God's pleasure, right? So our flesh is the captive exile, all right? He says the captive exile hastens that he may be loosed, that he should not die in the pit, what do you read in Psalms 38, verse 3? He says, um, verse 4, he says, For my iniquities have gone over my head. When you are in the pit, the ground is over your head. The dirt is over your head. The, the sin is over your head. The Bible says the, the captive exile is, is, is eager is agitated to get out because you do not want to die in your sin. You don't want to die in the pit and that his bread should not fail. You are there saying these things are too heavy for me because bread represents life. The Lord would have me say to you today that look at verse 15. He says, but I am the Lord your God who divided the sea whose waves roared the Lord of hosts is my name. 
the seed that was supposed to bury you, I divided it so that you can walk on, on solid ground. My grace is enough for you. The Lord is letting you know that he wants you to think more of his goodness than you think of your weakness. Because that which you continue to think about is what you magnify. And that is what you, and what you magnify is what you worship. So stop magnifying your weakness. God is so good to you. When you focus on him, you become more like him. The Bible says we beheld him and we became radiant. We beheld him and are radiant and our faces knew no more any shame. So stop beholding yourself. Behold him and you will see that the shame will fall off because you will be transformed by beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. That comes with a warning though because when the Lord was telling me this thing, he also told me, he said, tell them that the seductress is that voice that keeps telling them to do their own pleasure. You know, some of us, we f it feels good to us to punish other people when they have done wrong. When you, when you keep malice, it feels good to you. You like it because that's how the other person knows that they have done badly. That is your pleasure, the pleasure of your flesh. The Lord is saying, I want you to behold me, but I don't want you to enslave them. Let them go. Set them free. Don't give in to the seductress. Behold me and you will be illuminated. Alrighty. There's one more thing. And Chris is going to come up. Okay. So that one more thing is Exodus. Come with me to Exodus to the very end of it. Exodus 40 verse 2. The Bible says, on the first day of the first month, you shall, you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. On the first day of the first month, you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. Let me quickly give to you uh, an understanding that the Lord gave to me because many of us, we are trapped in our thought process. We keep thinking the same way and it's not helping us to get out. So the first day of the first month, you need to set up the tent of meeting. The tabernacle of meeting is, your, is, your, is, is, is where you engage God. And it, hap it has to happen on the first day and when? On the first month. So what happens? What makes a day a day? The sun rises and it sets. So every time a thought rises, you need to make sure that it rises in light. If it's not rising in light, you need to speak light over it. So the moment that thought comes and it doesn't look like light, it wants to take your day away. Because some of you, you know that when you wake up and you allow thoughts of guilt, of, of, of unforgiveness, or failure, or just sadness, sometimes the devil just blows a sad wind and you forget that you have the joy of the Holy Spirit. Whenever that comes, what does it do? It takes away the rest of your day, doesn't it? And then the day goes and you're like, oh, I can't even have a righteous expectation. I've, I've just, this has happened, that has happened. I don't want anybody to miss this, including Rosemary. Here is the deal. When you think about the rising and the setting, that is the first day. And it also says what the first month. What is a month? A month means a circuit, that which goes and comes around and it has a pattern and it keeps repeating itself the moon keeps going and coming back every 28 days and so the Lord is saying I'm talking about the fact that you need to be intentional about every thought that rises in your mind so that you can destroy every pattern that is against you there is an increase in the bombardment of our minds in the news and around us by lies. And that is why there is an increase also now, or at least not before now, not now, but before now, there's an increase in the principles and the guiding light concepts that are coming forth from this altar so that you are as equipped as you need to be. I'm going to leave you with that one tonight, but I want to encourage you go and meditate upon it the first day and the first month. Engage the Lord. God bless you. Chris. Amen. Arise, ignite, and go. <clears throat> All right.
So we're back at it again on uh, next Tuesday with our family dinner and teaching at 6.30 p.m. So hope to see each one of you there. Um, and also, as Pastor called us out, I got that Watchmen joke, by the way. Um, the Watchers and the Watchmen. If you know anything about Enoch, you, you know about the Watchers. Um, so with the second watch, Wednesdays at 9 p.m. on the Communion House uh, Instagram page, uh, make sure that we all tap in and be there. Um, he definitely called us out, so we got to show up. God is good. So, yeah, I just want to make sure we put that out there and we all show up and do what we're supposed to do. God is good. Amen. Sorry about the complete fusion there, y'all. Um, okay, so if everybody would please bow their heads. I just want to say a prayer. Father, we just thank you for allowing us to be in your presence today, Lord. Allowing us to receive your word and, and that bread that only comes from you, Lord. We just thank you. Just thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you for the man of God just allowing us to cling closer to you and to just understand your wills and your way. And just understand when your spirit is speaking to us, Father. We thank you for all the blessings that you have on the way, all the blessings that we may overlook. We are so grateful, Father. And we just ask that you just continue to guide our thoughts, our ways, and our minds. And Lord, we just thank you for all you're doing. Allow us to make it home and to our destination safely. And Father, we just love you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray, amen.